Steve Mayfield is the co-director of the Center for Food and Fuel for the 21st Century and the director of the San Diego Center for Algae Biotechnology. Tonight, he'll discuss how both food and fuel are derived from photosynthesis and how by using design for purpose photosynthetic organisms, we have the opportunity to develop production platforms for fuel and food that have unmatched efficiencies and productivities, which will be required if the world is to rise to our standard of living. Steve. Thank you, Lauren. Uh, that's a tough act to follow. <laughs> and, I, and I know now I have to be very careful about any emails I ever send Seth. Um, so, so let me start, you know, I, I was gonna talk tonight um, about fuel and, and peak oil and how energy is equated to our economy and all of the problems associated with it. But I've spoken three times in the last few months that Chancellor Kosla has been there and by now he must be so sick of that talk that I decided instead I'm gonna talk about the little things that we do in lab but maybe how the little things we do ultimately can change the world. So what I'm gonna tell you about, I'm gonna tell you about food and fuel and why we think about it, but then I'm gonna tell you about how rainbow-colored algae can change the world. But let me start with food and fuel, and why do we think of these two things together? We think of these two things together because chemically they're the same thing. So both are chemical energy, the energy in a substance that can be released by a chemical reaction to do work. So we can eat a Big Mac and hop on our bicycle and ride down to the university. Or we could go buy a gallon of gasoline and put it in our car and we could drive down to the university. So we can accomplish the same thing with both of those. But in fact, in this country, we take a fair amount of our food, about 40% of our corn crop this year, and we are gonna turn that into 40, 14 billion gallons of ethanol, and we are gonna blend that with our gasoline. So in fact, we do take food and turn it into fuel. And I couldn't find the exact chemical composition of a Twinkie, but I am pretty certain that is somebody who's taken petroleum and turned it into food, <laughs> okay? Okay, but beyond that, not only are they interchangeable to a degree, they actually come from the same thing. So fuel and food are the products of the conversion of sunlight energy into chemical energy by the process of photosynthesis. So what photosynthesis does is it takes CO2, it pulls it out of the atmosphere, and in a set of complex reactions, it turns it into sugar, it releases oxygen, thank God for all of us, and it turns that into carbohydrates and proteins and lipids, or fats. And clearly you recognize those as food, as the things we eat. But in fact, all of petroleum is simply ancient algae, and all of coal is ancient plants. So these are simply fossilized photosynthetic products. So in fact, 70% of the economy, and that is fuel, and that is food, and that is chemicals that we make from petroleum, are in fact simply photosynthetic products. That's why it's so important. Now over the last 50 years, we've had enormous productivity increases in food yield on this planet, right? That was brought about by something called the Green Revolution. And here's just a couple of examples of that. This happens to be wheat production in India, but you could look at any grain, you could look at any agricultural production, and what you'd see is over the last 50 years, we've doubled or tripled, or sometimes those have gone up eightfold, okay? We did that without increasing the number of people working on the farms. In fact, they've gone down dramatically. We did it by, without increasing the amount of land, we did this by mechanizing agriculture. But that comes at a cost. That comes at a cost that we've got to get a lot more tractors, we have to put a lot more fertilizer on this, and we have to use a lot more energy. So another way to show this is this slide. And this is a little bit of an alarming slide if you think about the history of mankind. And what this plots is production of energy, that's the blue line right there, over the last 10,000 years. But this could go back much longer than that oil and coal built up over the last 300 million years. We have simply exploited them really just for the last 100. And then overlaid on top of that is world population. So what it's pretty clear to see is that what we've done really well over the last 100 years is take petroleum 
and turn that into unprecedented production in agriculture, and that has allowed world population to hit the seven billion people we have on the planet today. So where the real issue comes is, well, what do we do now as fossil fuels start to decline? And we're not in any stretch gonna run out of them, but what they are gonna do is get more expensive. And that's the real issue, okay? This is a plot of the price of corn over the last 30 years, plotted against the price of oil. And as long as we were producing oil very cheaply at $20 a barrel, even though we were using a huge amount of that for agriculture, it really didn't impact the price. But starting in about 2005, as the price of oil really started to go up, then it became a significant component of food. And now the price of food and the price of fuel spike together. Right, so when we had that big, big spike in oil in 2007, up went the price of corn. When we had the big spike that we're having right now, back up it comes again. So our real challenge is how are we going to very efficiently turn photosynthesis into the products that we need for the future? And now what I'm gonna show you is, okay, that's the big picture, but now what I wanna show you is a bit of the little picture, a bit of the stuff that we do in my lab that someday is gonna impact this, okay? So why do we think about algae for this? There's really a variety of reasons, but the most important ones are that it's very efficient in photosynthesis. Much better than any plant out there, you can turn sunlight and chemical energy into products. We can go to very large scale, and it's got an enormous diversity. Diversity means there are lots of different algae out there, and we know how to manipulate them, so we can do engineering, and we can make all kinds of products. We can make food, we can make fuel, and we can make wrinkle cream. And that, this is a wrinkle cream made from algae. But what I'm gonna tell you a little bit about now are some of the products that we've made, okay? So the first one we made, or the first set that we made that I really like, are rainbow-colored algae. So here's the genes we put in. That one's called blue fluorescent protein, cerulean green, and we have blue algae and cyanobac cyanoalgae and green and yellow. And so I know what you're all thinking. When will these be available in a store near me, and will they be in time for Christmas? Probably not, and that might not be what you're thinking. You may be thinking, what does this have to do with food or fuel? Well, I would argue that if you can make rainbow-colored algae, you can make anything, right? And we have made just about anything, right? But they're also a very powerful tool, and in fact, the Nobel Prize was given to Roger Chen here several years ago for developing these because we can do lots of really cool things with them. Here we looked at simply different parts of the cell, the nucleus, the mitochondria, the chloroplast, all with different fluorescent proteins, okay? But here's another one product that we've made. This one is very interesting. It's called mammary-associated amyloid protein. This comes from colostrum. It's one of the first things that mom puts out. All newborns get it, right? And what it does is that stimulates mucus production in your gut. So here's wild-type algae, it doesn't make that. Here's two transgenic lines, they make serum amyloid very well, mammary-associated amyloid very well. And what that protein does is when you eat colostrum or you eat the algae, it stimulates mucus production in your gut and that gives you a physical protection from bacterial and viral infections. So why is that important? That's important because the number one killer on the planet is actually bacterial diarrhea. It's dehydration of kids. So this project is now funded by the Gates Foundation we produce this algae, we send it back to a group in Nebraska, they put it through pig trials, and what happens is when the pigs eat this, it stimulates mucus production in their gut, you get some bad water with some bacteria in it, you don't get bacterial diarrhea, you continue to put on weight, and in fact, we're gonna launch a, a company with this very soon. <laughs> but after we made that, we said, well, let's make some more sophisticated proteins, and the next one we made were malaria proteins. So here's simply two different algae making two different malaria surface proteins, these happen to be called PFS 25 and 28, you can get antibodies against those, and here we can see that the antibodies recognize them, so we know we're making the right protein. We purified those from algae, and then we injected them into mice. And we did that so we could have a malaria vaccine. And what this shows is here's the malaria parasite with sera taken from the mouse that we injected with those algal proteins, and they have antibodies now in that sera that recognize the surface antigens on this malaria bug. <laughs> just the same way that this malaria monoclonal antibody does. So we know we're recognizing the right thing. More importantly, we can actually take the blood from those mice, we can feed it to mosquitoes, and we did this in collaboration with Joe Vinets here at the med school, and when those mosquitoes eat the blood that have our vaccine in it, what happens is those mosquitoes no longer propagate the malaria bug. So we've got a malaria vaccine, and I'm gonna show you one last one really quickly, which is once we got there, we said, well, what's the most expensive drug out there? And the most expensive drugs out there are these very fancy 
magic bullets in cancer. So they have an antibody domain and a toxin domain on them. And there are several of these that are going through clinical trials. They work really well, but they are very expensive. One of them that is coming onto the market now is $160,000 for four doses. So we said maybe there's a chance we could make these in algae and greatly reduce that price. So we tried a couple different ones. We tried one that just had a single antibody binding domain, and then we made another one that had two antibody binding domains and two toxins on it. And this is the last slide I'll show you. So this is the antibody alone. It does not kill the cancer cells. Here's our single-headed one, kills them very efficiently. Our two-headed one kills them even better. And when we inoculate those tumors into mice, we can actually cure those mice of the tumor. So with our little guy, we've managed to make now three different, very, I think, exciting potential drugs for the future. So the last challenge we have is how are we going to get this to really large scale? This is an energy company that I started here called Sapphire Energy. This is their production site down in Columbus, New Mexico. It is now 100 acres of algae. They are growing this to produce bioenergy, but this same process can be used to produce any of the compounds that I just showed you. And I'll end it simply by saying that we are the San Diego Center for Algae Biotechnology and Food and Fuel for the 21st Century, and you can follow us on those websites. Thank you for your attention. Thank you.